your hands, your feet, and show your love and concern to the families that have lost loved ones, to those that are sick. Help us, Father, to do and say kind things to those around us. Help us always be willing to share your word. We thank you for our Savior, and we pray, Father, we'll keep our eyes fixed upon him and live our lives following his footsteps. Be with us, Father, this hour as we study your word. Help us to apply it to our lives, to share it with those around us. Help us, Father, to let, never look back at failures, but always press forward in our work in the kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I can't see close up if I do this, and I can't see y'all if I do that, so we're going to do that. <clears throat> our lesson tonight is going to come from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, but again, we've got a lot of Bible verses. Make sure you have a pen ready so you can circle key words in the Bible verses that we Go over tonight so you can recall those. As you're doing your own personal Bible studies, you'll see that note sometime in the future and say, oh yeah, I remember what that means. So get your pens out, your Bibles out, and we'll get started. What is the greatest invitation that you have ever received? Okay, if y'all don't tell, I'm going to tell mine. 19, early 1980s, I can't remember the exact date, but I was on honor guard in the United States Air Force, and President Reagan's plane flew in, so we had to stand there at the steps, he gets off, gets in his limousine, drives off, that was not the invitation to go riding in the limousine, but after he left and clears the area, then the crew comes out and invites us to come onto his airplane and look around. I thought that was the coolest thing in my life. And they even gave us some little memorials. We still have them at the house, the, being on his plane. Some people were getting playing cards, and by the time it was my turn, I got a box of matches, but I still have them. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so being a young airman at the time, I thought well, this is the coolest thing ever. So later, um, <clears throat> President Bush the first came into town, got to do the same thing. Again, a box of matches. And then, um, which one couldn't spell potato? Dan Quayle came into town, and I got a box of playing cards and left them when I left that job. Never got my playing cards. <laughs> but I thought it was really neat just to get and see inside of Air Force One and uh, <coughs> see all that they do and be in there. Uh, one time I went into a hangar on the, uh, some, the stealth airplanes had just come out, and I was not invited. <coughs> I just saw the, the hangar lights were off, and I thought, that's really strange. I'll go see what that's about. So I went into the hangar, and all I heard was click, click, and you don't need to be here. And I said, okay, I'm leaving. <coughs> but I did get to see the stealth plane before they did that. So, so there are times that uh, we were not invited. And you'll have something in your life that you'll recall a great invitation that someone has made to you. But the greatest invitation in all of our lives is when we became Christians. Here in our parable tonight, Jesus is talking to the Jewish nation. They had been invited over and over by God, and they had refused his invitation. They continue to refuse his invitation. So Jesus has just made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem where they're shouting Hosanna. <clears throat> he had just cleansed the temple for the second time of money changers. It's right after he had cursed the fig tree that would not bear fruit. And they had come to Jesus and they were asking by what authority, by whose authority are you doing these things? And Jesus perceived what they were thinking in, in their hearts and he said, I'll ask you a question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they knew the predicament of the question that Jesus had just asked them. Because if they said from heaven, then Jesus would have responded, then why didn't you listen to him? Because he proclaimed that Jesus was the Lamb of God. That, come, that had come to take away the sins of the world. So they told him that he couldn't answer. And Jesus said, well, I can't answer yours either. I'm not going to answer yours either. So that's sort of the background of this parable of what's all taken place. <clears throat> if you'll look there in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, it says, And Jesus spoke, 
spake to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. <clears throat> so who is the king? God. Who's the son? <clears throat> so he's, he's making, he's preparing a feast for those that will accept the invitation. There's a lot of blessings <clears throat> that come from being in Christ. Someone turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and read verse 3 for us. In Christ. So the first thing I want you to circle tonight in your Bibles is those last two words. It's in Christ. Spiritual blessings only come if you are in Christ. They're not for those outside of Christ. So how does one get in Christ? Baptism. Turn to Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Our baptism. Our baptism into Christ is where we come into contact. We are in Christ. And at that point, we can enjoy the spiritual blessings of being in Christ. What are those spiritual blessings? First over in Mark chapter 10, verse 30. Start here. So out the side of that, put Christians have the promise of eternal life. Behind your mark, chapter 10, verse 30, put Christian promise and circle eternal life. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. So out beside Matthew chapter 6, 30, verse 33, right, the Christian promise is God will take care of my earthly needs, earthly needs. Turn over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. So put Christian promise, God's providence, to do good things for me. To work out the, whatever situation I am in life, God's going to work it out so that he is glorified by that situation. Then look over at John chapter 10 and verse 10. Circle the word life and circle the word more or circle the words more abundantly. And Jesus, when he's talking about in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he's talking about now. He came that you could, through him, enjoy life and enjoy the things of this life abundantly, not just as they happen, but he wants you to enjoy life abundantly, that life in him. Back to our lesson in Matthew chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that they sh they, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings, 
are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Our job as children of God, as Christians, is to go out and plant seeds. We're to teach. We're to teach Jesus to a lost world. And those that are receptive to that lesson, we're to baptize <coughs> into Christ. Add them, God will add them to his family, the church. Okay? Does that make pretty clear? That's how it works. <coughs> There's going to be lots of times that you're out there teaching someone and they will not accept the invitation. So at that point, what do you do? Darnell? You pray for them. That's right, Jill. You pray for them. You pray, you pray. You keep them on your prayer list. <clears throat> but you've got to move on. And that's hard. That's real hard. When it's family, when it's Someone that's just saying, I don't want to hear that anymore, Paul. I don't want to hear it. It's hard. But you've got to let go. That's their decision. And you've got to move on. And you've got to teach someone else because your job is to plant seeds. Your job is not to outbreak somebody. Or, your job is not even to judge them. Your job is to keep going, spreading the gospel throughout the world. Yes, sir. You do. And they do. That's exactly right. And I'm saying pray for them and keep it, keep in touch. It's not saying shut them down, but you've got to use your, your energy and go in and keep teaching. Don't stop. Don't let them, don't let it get you down where like, well, they gave up. Well, you know, we did that back in the seventies and it didn't work. You got to keep pressing forward because you've got to use all the available time you have to keep spreading the word. Um, Maurice's brother that was baptized Monday night, that's been a 35 year process. And it's just baby steps, baby steps. And it just so happened we hit, um, he came over Saturday night. <coughs> and uh, I mean, I was tired, okay? I'd worked all day, I was tired. And he came over to ask some advice. <laughs> and we turned that into a Bible study. And that led to, this is what you need to do. And he agreed. So Monday night, we came up to the building. And he's baptized. But that's a 34, 35 year process to do that. So didn't forget him. But during that time, you have to keep going forward. So that's right. Notice in, that, in verses 3 and 4 that God sent forth his servants time and time again to bid the Israelites to come to the feast. They would not. Turn to Acts chapter 7 and someone read verses 51 and 52. So I think, Meryl, that's pretty much what you were just saying. It's time and time. God never gave up. He kept trying and trying and trying. But now he's about to open the invitation up to everyone. Everyone. The king said, all things are ready. <laughs> Look over at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. The perfect time, fullness of time, the perfect time. 
God sent forth his son, Jesus the God-man. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. The perfect time, the perfect circumstance. The world and history was at that point in time, that's when God sent forth his son. Mark 9, verse 1. There, will, there are some that will teach you, or teach you, they'll try to teach you, they'll try to tell you that Jesus and God, things just didn't work out. That because the Israelites were not receptive uh, to Jesus, he sort of got caught up in a movement, and he's going to have to come back and finish the job later that they crucified him, that it was a failed campaign, and now he's got to come back and rule for a thousand years and all that other stuff you've heard, and none of that's true. None of that's taught. None of that from the Old Testament through the New Testament is ever taught. Jesus came at the perfect time, under the perfect circumstances, just according to God's plan. He sent his son here to die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The only sacrifice that could be made for you and I. Because without that sacrifice, without Jesus going to the cross, <clears throat> we're all lost. We have no hope. We have nothing without Jesus at that time going to the cross for us. Because there can be no other sacrifice for our sins. There's no other way to God except through Jesus and through the sacrifice he made through his blood that you come in contact with in baptism when you're put in Christ, when you enjoy the blessings of Christ. But it was at the perfect time, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that would forgive us of our sins. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Do 24, verse 47. I thought you said seven. It's okay. 24. Just do 47, too. That was a good one. <laughs> 24, verse 47. Oh, 47? Mm-hmm. <coughs> and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached unto his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. So, starting in Jerusalem, out to all the world, the invitation is fixing to spread across the globe from what was happening there. <clears throat> now, God made provisions for the feast. The invitation is there. <clears throat> if you refuse the invitation, is that God's fault? Yes. Whose responsibility? Yes. Yep, the invitation is there. But if you refuse the invitation... Refuse his invitation. That's your fault. That's my fault. That's my choice. <clears throat> it was, it's really uncommon, especially during this period of time, and even through the Dark Ages. The king would ask you to come into his presence, and you refuse. That means instant death. You had given up your life for refusing the king's invitation to come in there. We were studying... Um, Esther with Tim and it, it talks about it even during that period of time coming into the king's presence without an invitation meant death refusing the king's invitation meant death it does but it's your choice this king gives the, gives the invitation <coughs> and you're invited 
But if you don't come, that death is your choice. Right? <coughs> so, turn to Matthew chapter 20, back to 22, and we're going to read verses 5 and 6. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. We have to realize the need to answer the invitation. So the invitation that's put before us, the urgency of accepting the invitation and not making excuses. I mean, if here they not only rejected the invitation, but they made fun of it, of the king inviting them to it. It's spiteful, it's rude, it's uh, <clears throat> ignorant. But they did. Turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And can you flip over to Romans chapter 6 and read 23 real quick too? So at that point, when you're on um, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, circle eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Free gift. Cost you nothing. Cost him everything. Cost you being a follower, giving up things of this world, but it's a free gift. It's the only gift. But it was free for you and for me. When you start looking at the gift and, the, and what our Savior had to go through, they say that, <clears throat> scholars say, not me, but scholars say, that as they were nailing Jesus' hands and his feet to the cross, that's when he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not only did Jesus teach that a few chapters earlier, but he's living out what he preached, being nailed to a cross. Father, forgive them. When you start studying the cross and what Romans did to crucified victims and how they scourged them before they were put on the cross, it brings tears to my eyes when I read about it, when I study about that part. It cost him everything. But it's an open invitation to us. It's an open invitation to anyone that we teach. Turn over to Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. And that's the catch. Because of our short-sightedness, our short vision, or how we have to focus on material things in this life, we have to touch it, we have to hold it. It has to be something tangible that we can wrap our arms around and we can't see the forest for the trees. Can't see that eternal life is the real answer. Can't see that the things of this earth mean absolutely nothing. Nothing. Even Jesus is saying, even if you gain the whole world. So you're Bill Gates. One of the richest men in the world in our lifetime. And Jesus is saying, even if you had it all, you lose your soul, it's all for nothing. Because the real thing is not this life. It's eternal life. That's the message we have to get out. That's the message that our family right here has to get out there. Is the real answer is eternal life. So you can make $60 billion a year 
But if you lose your soul, it doesn't mean anything. I've told you all this before. I, I go by the graveyard down in Trussell, and I look over there and just wonder, where's all their stuff? Who's got their stuff? And in my business, see them fighting and arguing over neckties. And it's like, really? They sell them. You can go get you one. And I have people tell me all the time, when it gets down to money, people go nuts. And I said, yes, I see it every day. It's just stuff. It means absolutely nothing. I guarantee you, if you're like my family, there's always three glad trash bags of clothes that you're about to give away in the closet, right? Shoes you haven't worn in six or seven years. That's me, not Marisa. <laughs> I still have the, what's the hippie shoes? The ones that don't have a back on them. Birkenstocks. I still got some Birkenstocks. I got dust all over, but I still got them because I might wear them one day. I don't have the plastic ones. I mean, they got the real Birkenstock. <laughs> cowboy boots. I do wear my cowboy boots. <laughs> but I've got tennis shoes. Do I look like I wear tennis shoes? No. <laughs> we have loads and loads and loads of stuff. And we're never going to use it. It's just stuff. We've got the latest fads and... Richard was talking about that. He saved all his money up to buy a gaming system, and by the time he got it bought, it was already out of date. And that's with everything. The fanciest new car with all the gadgets, as soon as you buy it, they're ba making one that's a lot better. iPhone 10, X, S, something like that now. People standing in line for weeks to have a phone. And you got to have Wi-Fi, and you got to have all the other little add-ons in there. I did a tax return for somebody this week. Their phone bill, $6,500 for the year. <laughs> oh, they had all the gadgets. They had a, that was their phone. That was not a family plan. That was their phone. Because I made them prove it to me when they told me that bill. I said, $650? No, $6,500 for a phone bill. Not the phone. The phone bill. That's nuts. It's like, what are you doing? Well, I watched this, this, and this on there. And it's like $6,500. That's a lot. And then you see other crazy things that uh, I, get, I ask all the time. Can I deduct that? That's, that's a question I get all the time. Is this, is this something I can deduct? No. No. And so now I started giving a list and they were telling Marisa and Cindy in the office of Learn. They're like, he's going to say no. <laughs> so they're, they're screening for me. But it's just stuff, y'all. It's just stuff. It's not going to save your soul. And Jesus is saying that is the most important thing, your soul. Forget all this stuff and think about heaven. Think about eternity. Think about your neighbors, your friends. Where are they going to spend eternity? What are they focused on? What do they care about? And then teach them from there. That's the starting point. We talked last week to, about <coughs> the rich man and Lazarus, and I told you all that that's a great starting point and how many people were interested in that subject. That subject quickly goes to where are you going to spend eternity? Quickly. And they start thinking. And you can start teaching and showing. It's the invitation that's open to them just like it's open to us. And a lot of them don't even know they've been invited to, to the feast. <clears throat> lady I taught the gospel to several years ago. And I've told you all this before too, I believe. <clears throat> she was in her 30s, mid-30s at that time. She had never opened a Bible. Everything she knew about Jesus was from TV or what somebody else had taught her, told her. She didn't know if it was truth or not because she had never opened a Bible. 
you got neighbors all around you that are just like that. Just waiting for somebody to show them the way, to give them that invitation. Matthew chapter 22, verse 7. <clears throat> but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city. God views the persecution of his people as a personal attack. In Acts 9, verse 4, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why perse persecutest thou me? Jesus takes it personal when his family is being persecuted, when, when the church is being hurt, when somebody does something against the church. Jesus takes that personal. He wouldn't say, and why are you doing it to them? Jesus said, why are you doing that to me? The people who refused the invitation and persecuted the messengers in our parable paid a great price. They were destroyed. And that's where, if you're doing personal evangelism and you're teaching them, you've got to show them the importance and stress the importance that their eternity is away from God. And it is punishment. Like we studied last week, begging for one drop of water. And that rich man has been there for 2,000 years begging for that drop of water. Begging you and I not to come to that place. Abraham said, it's all right here. All you've got to do is study this, understand it, apply it, obey it faithfully and not go to that place. Matthew 22, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> then saith he to the servants, The wedding is ready, and they which are bidden were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. <clears throat> so some people, when you're teaching and working with them, <clears throat> they don't think that they're worthy of becoming a child of God because of some circumstance in their life, because things that they have been through in their lives, they don't think that they're worthy, will ever be worthy, or ever be in a place where God will forgive them of their past sins. That's sad. Is that true? No. Nope. That is not true. So how do you teach someone that is feeling like that? That's just not true. What, sir? And tell us what he said at the end of his life. That's exactly right, sir. That's exactly what I do. Is I take them there and I say, look, you want to see an example? God gave us one. And it is the Apostle Paul. He was there approving of them stoning Stephen to death. He was holding the garments. And when I picture that situation... I see Paul with that smirk on his face. Like, yeah, he's getting his. He's getting his. I'll hold his clothes. I'll hold y'all's clothes. Y'all go take care of him. And just like Serge said, he was out there killing our brothers and sisters in Christ. He had documents from the high priest, and he was going out, and he was, he was dead set. He was going to put this movement out until the road to Damascus. He prays after he meets Jesus because Jesus told him to go in and he would be told what to do. He prays. He's there praying. Why are you praying, Paul? Get up. Rise. Be baptized. Wash away your sins. And from that moment on, what do you see Paul doing? When I was a young kid, I'd call it a 365. It's really a 180. Do what? He goes out and he starts preaching. 
And he doesn't matter if it's a king. It doesn't matter if it's a young man. He's preaching Jesus the Christ and tell, telling other people, hey, I am the chief of sinners. There's nobody, you can't come up with something worse than what I was doing. I was punishing the body of Christ, intent on destroying the body of Christ. And I was wrong. And he was telling everyone, I was wrong. And God forgave me. He can forgive you too. There's no one unworthy. Yes, sir. I think that's uh, one reason that uh, Jesus picked Paul to do what, uh, what he does, to carry his word, is to, is to show people that, that he, anybody can get forgiveness, whatever they've done. Picked a lot of them for that. He stayed with Peter when Peter denied him three times too, right? You can be forgiven then too, even as you're close, you're right next to Jesus, one of his four. I don't know, fishermen do some pretty bad things sometimes. <laughs> I know a few people that were in the Navy. Matthew 22, to, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll give you one better than that. You know what an honor it is to go before the throne of God and call him Father? Everyone, in the Old Testament, I mean, when Jesus said that, they're like, oh, no, you, you can't do that. Jesus said, yes, you can. He's your father. You can say, Abba, Father, my father. And he loves you and he cares for you just like a father. Just like he's talking about in here. The invitation is there. He wants you to come to the feast. He wants to be close to you and to me. He wants us to bow before his throne. He wants us to work in the kingdom. He wants us to spread the word. He wants to bless you and encourage you. And he wants us to encourage each other. But it is an honor to be able to go before the throne of the creator, the father, and say, Father. And to be able to go for him and say, I really messed up. I have really messed up today. I've tried, but I messed up. Can you help me? And know that he's going to help. Are there some problems in my life that I need some direction on? I can go to his word and I can find that direction. Every single time. There is nothing, not a circumstance in your life that God has not addressed in his word. It is. Study this parable. <clears throat> Study it from the aspect of it being an, an invitation to you, to those around you. Go down and read the section about someone trying to get into the wedding. They didn't have the proper garments on. It means they weren't in Christ. 
had not obeyed the king's command, had the wrong clothes on. See how it happened to that man. Thank y'all for coming tonight. Next week, Tim's back. So Tim, I start our regular Wednesday night class. It's been an, an honor to get to, to teach these lessons and these parables to you. Uh, hope you've learned. I've learned putting them together. So thank y'all very much for coming and, and listening and being here and encouraging. You did a real good job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.